Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to start in a few minutes. We're seeing folks populate lots of familiar names and faces. Hello, everyone. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get going here so we can try and stay on time. My name is Julie Baker. I'm the Executive Director of Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates. And thanks, Leticia, for welcoming people into the space. And Leticia is one of our fabulous board members for Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates. We've got a number of them here today, including Gustavo Herrera, who's the Executive Director of Arts for LA who's also on our board and we're so um, pleased to be presenting this with Arts for LA today. Also, Michael Alexander is with us today and uh, Tomas Benitez. Um, and I'm not sure if there's others here yet from our board, um, if you are, speak up. Um, but I'm, I wanted to introduce, if I could, um, our uh, board president, Victoria Hamilton, who's also um, hails from San Diego and uh, she's got a special, special message for this meeting and for advocacy uh, this year as well. And uh, Jade Alicia, if we could get that slide up, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Julie. Um, we're going to uh, dedicate this meeting and um, our advocacy efforts in 2021 to the legacy of Larry Baza. Many of you know Larry um, from uh, being a member of the arts California Arts Council and uh, the chairman. Um, he passed away from COVID on February 20th. His accomplishments are deep. Um, he is recognized as an arts warrior, a change maker, a community leader, and a, <clears throat> a champion of social justice. Um, we, we all miss him across the state and certainly in San Diego where he was the um, chairman of the city's City of San Diego Commission for Arts and Culture. Um, for those of you who met, had the opportunity to meet him, you know that he brought joy and light into every room he entered. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, and thank you for um, sharing his legacy with all of us here also in Los Angeles. And uh, we've been dedicating this year to um, our advocacy efforts to the, his legacy and to his memory. So if we could just go to the next slide then, I'll share with you a little bit about our agenda today. And um, coming up next is uh, Kristen Sakota from the Los Angeles Department of Arts and Culture. And uh, the state, I will give a quick state update on all the things that are happening. We'll do some more local updates with Danielle Brazel and Gustavo Herrera and Tomas Benitez. And then we'll have a chance to really have a conversation. And that's really what these are. We do call them regional conversations. As you'll see when we're not slide sharing, this is a meeting format. So we will hopefully see your beautiful faces um, if you keep your screen on. Um, if not, that's fine too. If you want to speak up, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, you can certainly um, add you know, questions or comments in the chat. And um, we'll just, we'll be doing some polls throughout as well. And we appreciate you responding to those polls. And um, I just also wanted to ask that if you would include in the um, chat where you're, the land that you're on in a land recognition, we would also really appreciate that. And um, and again, my name is Julie Baker. I'm the executive director of Californians for the Arts. My personal pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm coming from the land of the Nevada City Rancheria Nisanon, who are currently fighting for uh, federal recognition. Um, so I'd like to introduce to Kristen Sakota, as I know she is on a, um, a tight timeline here, and we're so grateful that she could join us to give us an update on what's happening at the county level. So much good stuff going on in response to all the needs of the field. So Kristen, please share um, what's happening in your world. Happy to. And first of all, I just want to say thank you so much, um, Julie, you and Californians for the Arts, and largely that's you. <laughs> you have been doing a phenomenal job, we all know, uh, and you're everywhere these days. Uh, and Gustavo as well. I uh, just want to thank you for all your efforts at the local level in LA County um, and the interplay between the two, which I think is important for keeping us all strong um, in solidarity and alignment and amplifying one another's voices. 
also really happy to see so many of my other colleagues uh, that I work with, that I partner with, that I aspire with and inspire with. Um, so Danielle, Leticia, Michael, Alexander, Tomas, et cetera. Um, great, great to see uh, everybody. So I'm happy to, to share a few things. Um, and just we'll start uh, by saying uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I don't doesn't know me. I'm the director of the LA County Department of Arts and Culture, um, and uh, African American woman with uh, auburn, very long, gotten very long since I haven't had a real haircut in about three years. Uh, <laughs> locks, uh, clear glasses, a smile on my face, and a civic art background from our civic art team. Okay. So I'm gonna just share a couple of things that are more like updates and opportunities that are that are kind of going on right now from our shop for the field. And then I'll talk a little bit, uh, uh, give a nod to some other field needs as I'm hearing them and as we're hearing them and seeing them and that relate to advocacy efforts that folks in, in this group will speak to later as well as we know that, that you're working uh, to push the needle on some of those. So just in terms of a few updates, uh, we work in a number of core areas, grants and professional development, uh, civic art, arts education. We also have a small but mighty research and evaluation team. And we're looking at the role of the arts across sectors in addition to advancing cultural equity and inclusion. So you'll hear a couple of these throughout. From our grants team right now, we have open a new uh, opportunity. That's a one-time opportunity, uh, a recovery grant that is specific to the second supervisorial district this funding is actually a legacy of former supervisor, Mark Ridley Thomas, uh, but being now the water is being carried by the amazing Holly J. Mitchell. And so there's a million dollar program. Uh, and what we are doing is we are funding arts organizations and social justice uh, organizations that use the arts in the second district. The goal is to invest in these organizations because we know they're a part of the cultural fabric of Los Angeles. And there is a priority, uh, not only do you have to be located in second district, but there is going to be additional consideration for those that reflect and serve our Black, uh, Latinx, and BIPOC communities and underserved communities. So that's open until March 24th. And I think there's even um, a, a technical assistance or webinar uh, today. But so anyone who knows anyone uh, who's in the second district, we're looking to go beyond our existing grantees to folks uh, who are not currently grantees of the county or and emerging folks as well. I also wanna highlight a bit of something that has closed, but now we're continuing to look at the impact and that was that we had the opportunity to gain access to CARES Act funds that came to LA County last year in 2020. That was a whole advocacy story of its own, what I like to call inside advocacy, um, in working to, to make sure we could get access to those funds and essentially get a carve out for the arts dedicated as part of LA County's COVID relief efforts for the small business sector, which uh, ran a portfolio of larger than 150 million. We had 12 million and we did uh, a CARES Act Arts Relief Fund through our department, and we ended up funding 337 arts nonprofits. And I just wanna share, you know, the testimonials we heard were really just incredible. We did very much a, we're trying to give as many organizations funding as we can uh, to, to address relief, and it was about losses and unanticipated expenses. I'll tell you right now, we had $12 million, uh, very significant for us, but the need that we heard just from those 350 about applicants of their losses and unanticipated expenses at that time, so this is in fall of 2020, was more than $230 million, just that group alone. So that just speaks again to the depth of the need. Uh, and we were proud to say that we prioritized small and mid-sized organizations, more than 90% of the dollars went to those uh, with a budget of 15 million and under, and about 70 to 75% went to those with a budget of 1 million and under, which is really the bulk of our field. That's also, again, where a lot of the organizations that are community-based organizations, serving low-income communities, BIPOC communities are in those buckets. Um, and that so many of them said they were gonna use it for payroll. So we know that supported jobs. I also just wanna acknowledge we have played a supporting role in uh, working with colleagues in private philanthropy. So the Getty, Parsons, and some national funders, uh, Mellon Foundation, Ford Foundation, et cetera, on something being called the LA Arts Recovery Fund. It was initiated by the Getty when they just did a visual arts version and they wanted to expand it into a regional effort. Now it is. So that uh, just closed. I believe the application just closed. It's being administered by California Community Foundation, CCF here in LA. And uh, an amazing note on that, we are still fundraising. 
So if there are other uh, big funders that want to contribute, please do. We are seeing organizations and foundations that have not been funding in the arts recently. We've been able to pull them back in. So CCF is not only administering it, they put dollars in and they haven't had an arts portfolio for a while. So we're seeing really a positive shift that we've been able to encourage there. And there's a commitment to BIPOC again through the Ford Foundation's Cultural Treasures Initiative, which you might know gave funding uh, to a couple of organizations in LA already on its own. And they're doing a regional approach. This fund is a regional partner. So it will have dedicated funding uh, matched by the Ford Foundation. Wanna just quickly share our, the arts internship program is open for students. Uh, we've pivoted it to, due, to, due to COVID to allow folks to, to participate. Um, we have uh, more than a million dollars invested in advancing creative careers with 228 internship slots this year. We're doing it more of a rolling basis rather than summer because of the dislocation with college students. They can apply on our website. And in arts education, the advancement grant program where we give funds to school districts to help them support music lessons, advancing uh, their strategic plans uh, around the arts, et cetera. Arts for LA has been a great advocacy partner in arts ed. Um, we uh, have those uh, advancement grants and those close, I think, March 10th. So that is also open right now. If you know a school district that should attend or should apply or has never worked with us, we're seeing new folks picking up north, like Lancaster area, as well as uh, new folks coming in. This all ties to the countywide blueprint for arts education, major public um, policy that was adopted by the Board of Supervisors in ah, October, I think, of 2020. It took us a couple of years to build it, and now it's essentially 2.0 of the regional blueprint for arts education. Access and equity is the name of the game, uh, but a big tent, tent around arts ed in school, but also in communities, connections to career pathways and systems involved youth and communities. So one little call to action we're putting out around that is we, we wanna start seeing more visibility around arts education and around mm -hmm. advancing the blueprint. Uh, oh, what happened? Oh, I think I just hear somebody talking. Okay, I'm like, what happened? Uh, we wanna see more visibility. So I just wanna say, if you are involved in arts education, we saw Culver City a feature in a newsletter, their participation in the TEAL program, which is technology enhanced arts learning. It's a teacher professional development on how to use the arts in schools. We're, we're gonna start really inviting folks to share out their work in arts education and the work that they're doing in this collective impact model that achieves these goals. Because I am, I am you know, very, um, and I know I'm probably achieve, almost at my time, so I'm gonna try to wrap, but I am very um, proud and also see the importance of uh, that old proverb, right? If you wanna go fast and far, go alone. If you wanna, uh, or sorry, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. We have been able to really go far with an incremental approach and really building uh, networks and coalitions. But I also know that this time of disruption means a time of opportunity and a time that we can really advance our goals in the arts, in creative recovery, and frankly, in cultural equity, racial equity, and social justice. And so I'm also all about like, this does not need to be an incremental moment. So how do we really fast forward and look ahead and say, what do we wanna achieve? How can we be goal oriented? So we, we wanna start getting more visibility onto the arts education, arts equity uh, front around the blueprint and around things like the county cultural policy, another major milestone passed last year, Due to COVID, we've not been pushing forward uh, hard on implementation, but we will uh, be doing that in the coming months. And so keep your eye out for that. Um, we anticipate likely doing a cultural needs assessment for uh, the county looking at and sort of benchmarking county current investment with where we wanna go in the cultural policy. And the uh, last pieces of that are measure J and the connections between arts and justice. We are following along. We hope you are participating in the community as well, articulating the role of the arts in justice reform, in youth development and in community reinvestment because we are having those conversations on the inside, but the Board of Supervisors is looking to hear it from the community uh, as well. And uh, those are the biggest things probably on our table right now. And the last one is just uh, what you're here already from Julie and others reopening these performing arts protocols, people really uh, need that. We need that advocacy. Museums are looking for advocacy and parity around how they're treated uh, in terms of reopening and then recovery. We're gonna, we're gonna need some continued investment uh, like the Creative Corps and others. And so we're looking forward to carrying, carrying that forward, participating with all of you and being part of the solution. Um, so I know you'll hear more about those later.
Yeah, well, thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you for your leadership, your energy, your enthusiasm, your go get them spirit. And that's what we all need in this time uh, in particular. And uh, we really appreciate you and appreciate you sharing all of these amazing things that you're doing. And I also appreciate a fast talker because I'm one of those as well. So thanks for that. And I'm going to jump into the next. And unfortunately, I, I don't know how long you can stay. So if people have questions for Kristen, can you please enter them into the chat right now so that we can make sure that we, she can stay we can get those to her and we can get you your answers but um, thanks again and I'm going to go ahead and do a quick presentation of what is happening at the state level if you'll indulge me hopefully I'll try and keep it to 10 minutes to share with you all um, what's happening um, at the state as I said and in the meantime we're going to start some polls because we want to see who's here with us in the room and um, who's not also um, and uh, and you'll be getting, I think there's a set of four polls. Some of them you'll have to scroll down. So sometimes there's two questions. This, the first one is just one question. All right, so let's get started here on what's going on. Um, some of you may be tuned into the um, uh, Otis report and we had the opportunity also to present there. And we have done two impact surveys um, this fall, early winter, that we really kind of gave you a snapshot in, in time in terms of um, in terms of uh, where people, uh, sorry, I got a phone call and that distracted me. Sorry about that. Anyway, so uh, we did about nine, close to a thousand workers were surveyed and over 600 organizations. Um, I just want to give you quickly, if I could, and I got to get rid of this poll because it's right in the middle of my uh, screen, uh, the key takeaways that we have, which is that, um, and, and I think all of you can attest to this, which is federal relief has been life line for the industry and unemployment for the self-employed has been a critical survival tool. We've actually for the very first time had federal pandemic unemployment assistance as we know uh, three and a half times more likely to be self-employed are artists and so we need these types, types of solutions. Um, until the sector is able to reopen again to full capacity financial relief to support arts workers and particularly because we see the disproportionate impact to the BIPOC communities is also essential. And as we continue to be closed, and um, uh, Kristen uh, alluded to some of the advocacy that we're working on, which has to do with getting reopening guidelines, we need to continue to get relief funds because we're still closed. We're still not earning the revenue that we are used to we're earning. Um, we also recognize through some of our surveys and others that nonprofit arts organizations and arts workers are, are already fragile in terms of the economic ecosystem. And the pandemic has only intensified the fragility in terms of um, what's happening for our sector. And that's something that as Kristen was sort of mentioning, it's really important that we talk, tell these stories. When we talk about who is a vulnerable workforce, it, it is arts workers. Um, and that's important for policymakers to understand. Um, we really need to look at what are some of the long-term systems to reimagine new arts nonprofit business models and to support arts workers who are self-employed. And we need to look at that system. How do we potentially implement long-term pandemic unemployment assistance if we're gonna continue to see self-employment as one of the main roles or the gig economy for arts workers? Um, and as I mentioned, our survey really highlights that arts workers are among our most vulnerable workforce. There's also startling statistics from Americans for the Arts as well, in terms of housing insecurity, food insecurity, homelessness um, that is happening to our sector. Um, and uh, it's really a combination of those fragile economic foundations as we're talking about, as well as the devastating and immediate, as we know, it was literally, you know, we, within weeks, everybody started to lose all their contracts, all these things were going on, uh, and a lack of safety net in infrastructure. Um, this was one of the startling things that we learned, and maybe you're starting to see some of the headlines and stories that we've received from our report, is that workers are literally barely hanging on in, in many circumstances. They're contemplating leaving the industry, and they're actually, we've, we saw 25% of workers said that they, they are looking at other industries, because what we're trying to illustrate also to policymakers is a part of that is there is no roadmap right now for us to reopen because we're not on the guidelines. Therefore, if you don't see yourself in terms of a future and you've already been enclosed for a year, what does that mean in terms of making some significant choices that you have to make about earning a livelihood? Um, we also know that mental health support was one of the top five needs for arts workers in our survey. And I think that's also critical importance that we need to talk about and we need to create systems to support uh, this really vital and critical workforce. 
And then uh, this is kind of the, the headline media piece of it of that we've been trying to really put out there because I think it's really important for people to understand is that without, with continued closures, without guidelines, um, and for, uh, we are facing potentially a California creativity crisis in terms of a pipeline of workers if they're leaving the state and they're leaving the industry and a pending cultural depression. And it doesn't mean that you're all not doing incredible work and doing everything you can to pivot and to continue to provide services, but we know that the impact has been severe in terms of furloughs and layoffs and terminations. We also saw in our survey the disproportionate impact to BIPOC workers and organizations. 100% uh, of those who identify as Black or African American and indicated a loss of income, while only 12% of other ethnic groups identified a similar loss. Of those who indicated need for rent or mortgage relief, 49% were BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, versus 29% who identified as white. Uh, BIPOC organizations and workers reported disproportionate access to CARES Act funding. This was something that was sort of talked about in the media, but not to the level that it really should be, which is, um, you know, 18 percent. And this is just our survey denied CARES Act funding versus 5 percent for non-Black Indigenous people of color. And this is interesting too, the private sector support for BIPOC organizations was higher from private foundations than non-BIPOC, 59% versus 53%, which is, I think is where you're seeing this, sort of, this emphasis on supporting uh, uh, organizations of color, uh, but lower for individual donors. So just again, quickly, 72% of orgs have terminated paid staff, 50% have terminated their contractors, 51% with salary reductions. Um, you know, they're primarily surviving because of programs like PPP and private sector support. This is really critical in, in our advocacy to have these types of data points so we can say why it's important that PPP is, continues and how much it has essentially kept our sector alive. And this is unfortunately part of the reality too, which is 16% of the organizations that we surveyed said that they're not confident they'll be able to survive if they can't open before April 1st. Um, I want to give a quick update on some of the stuff we're doing in terms of advocacy, specifically right now. We did a big hearing, um, I think it was in February, uh, the assembly hearing, Kristen and I both testified at the hearing on reopening arts safely. Out of that, some really significant things happened. Um, and I could say out of that, meaning that it was an opportunity for us to be heard. And as Kristen mentioned too, it's really critical for us to be heard. It's really critical for us to raise our voices. This is what Gustavo and I and our board and our staff work on on a daily basis, which is to give you the tools to be able to be effective advocates for arts and culture um, and for our sector. And so getting a, an opportunity at an assembly hearing for three hours to talk about the state of the arts was really helpful. Out of that, um, both California Association of Museums and our organizations lobbied the administration and the legislature to do dedicated funding for nonprofit cultural institutions out of the small business relief grants program that they've put through California Cal OSBA, the Small Business um, Advocates Organization. That, and I'm going to talk more about that. So the good victory was we were the only sector that was highlighted in this new early action of $2 billion in small business relief grants that were, was highlighted specifically just for cultural institutions. And there's an application process only for cultural institutions, March 16 through 23. That's coming up soon and we're going to have more information on that. And again, part of successful advocacy is to have some media coverage, which we've been working to get the word out about what's happening to our sector, along with our survey. Um, specifically on the California Relief Grant Program, if you are a nonprofit cultural institution, you have to be a 501c3. There's specific definitions of what it means to be a cultural institution, but performing arts organizations, venues, art galleries um, and so and museums, zoos and, and historical centers are all can all qualify. This gives you grant sizes between five and twenty-five thousand dollars based on your budget size. Um, but there is no cap on the revenue side. The rest of the whole program um, is actually um, the revenue cap is two and a half million. We lobby to have no revenue cap so everyone in the art sector can apply. Um, as I mentioned, the application is only open for one week. March 16 to 23, that's 12 days from now. Um, it just was announced yesterday. If you um, have received grants from the California Relief Grant Program in rounds one, two, or what's about to happen is round three, right before the 16th, you cannot apply for this. If you have not received or you've been waitlisted or any of the other communications you received, you can apply, but you must complete a new application, which again, will be open on March 16th. 
Um, and they'll be prioritized and document percentage revenue declines based on reporting periods comparing Q2 quarter, your second and third quarters of 2020 versus um, second and third quarters of 2019. California for the Arts and California Association Museums will be uh, partners, community partners to these the grant program. So we'll be doing a webinar, we'll be providing technical assistance, and we will be there for you not only in terms of the assistance, but an advocacy um, in what we're seeing in terms of this grants program. We will not, however, be have anything to do with who gets the grants. It's actually based on an algorithm. Um, and uh, so, you know, we just want to be there, though, and make sure that people apply because we fought for this funding. We want it to be seen that it is needed. But if it's people don't apply it, they won't think it's needed and then they won't give us any more money. And we know how critically it's needed. As Kristen mentioned, a $230 million was asked for in uh, LA County alone. Very quickly, again, I wanted to mention the California Creative Core pilot program that the governor introduced in his January budget for $15 million. This is a very specific program to employ artists and arts organizations for local communication strategies for public health mandates. We're very much in support of this. This is jobs creation. This is giving opportunity for artists to be seen as part of the solution. And it also is helping us get through this public health crisis. At the same time, we're also working on Senate Bill 628 as author, authored by Senator Ben Allen, sponsored by California Arts Advocates and Arts for LA, and that is the California Creative Workforce Act. And this is really more of a workforce development and training program for youth, veterans, and returning citizens to get into the arts, to get marketable skills in the arts to employ artists and community cultural organizations in neighborhood revitalization, infrastructure projects and housing initiatives and across government agencies, and a creative workforce program to give voice to the stories of the historically marginalized culture in California and to rebuild a more inclusive California in that recovery. If you know about the Works Project uh, Progress Administration, what we call the WPA from the 1930s, that was really partly to establish American culture versus European culture. It was a moment in time for that as well as jobs creation after the depression. We have a real moment in time to determine what is California culture and what is American culture today and whose voices have not been heard in this time um, or over the, the, you know, the centuries of who's been uh, represented as American culture. And I think this is an exciting time to really lift up all voices um, for California. Um, our advocacy priorities are reopening guidelines for the live events performing arts industries. There are none currently. If you go onto COVID-19CA.gov, you go under industry guidelines, you go in even the moderate or minimal tier of yellow and orange, and you type in live theater as an industry, it just says closed. That means that they have not given us guidelines, that we are not on the roadmap to see how we can reopen. This is a major issue for our sector that we really do need to make sure that we are getting that this is getting talked about. Um, I mentioned the California Creative Corps. We also have an exciting outcome of the um, hearing was that Sharon Quirk Silva, who's the chair of the assembly, um, did get put in support for a um, dollar for the arts. Um, and, um, and that's an exciting a new pr uh, initiative to get us to $40 million in programming funding for the California Arts Council versus 26 million in ongoing funds uh, to get us $1 per capita per person in the state of California. We also know there's gonna be funding needs for reopening the arts safely. And um, because you're gonna need to do ventilation, uh, performer testing, all sorts of things. We need to continue federal and state stimulus funding. We need to create these infrastructure and employment systems to support living wage and housing, food security, and mental health for artists. We have to radically, we know that this is a major issue with internally inside our art sector as well as externally out there in the world to reimagine our business models, our hiring practices, our board recruitment policies, resources, and programs, programs centered and funding and grant making in racial and cultural equity. And finally, we need to look at how can we provide new models and technical training and support for our sector. Uh, we've got our Culture and Creativity Month coming up in April. We hope that you'll engage with us. There'll be a lot more information coming. If you're not on our e-list, please join us. We've got, if you're new to advocacy and all of this is sort of like, what is she talking about and how do I engage and join with us on Advocacy and Government 101 on March 12th. If you um, want to engage in Arts, Culture and Creativity Month, join us on March 26th. And please reach out to us um, when you want to learn more. I probably went way over in my time. I'm gonna hand it over to Gustavo Herrera and uh, thank you. And then we'll get a chance to certainly have conversation around some of the things I just presented and talk about as well. So thanks for the time and Gustavo, what's happening in your neck of the woods? Awesome, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and Julie, thank you for, for that update. Uh, it's just incredible work that that's happening at the state level and we are proud 
uh, I'm both a proud board member, but also just proud partners of Californians for the Arts. I want to go back to uh, a phrase that um, Kristen shared uh, about going, if we want to go fast, let's go alone uh, or go alone. But if we want to go far, let's go together. That is really the purpose, the underlying purpose of these meetings is this is, this is really that moment for us as who identify as state advocates, who identify as local advocates. There is no state, local or fed advocates or, or advocates period. And so coming together during this, these regional conversations, that is the point to bring our advocacy together. Um, and so uh, it is my, I think, great pleasure at this point to, to introduce two, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the, two next speakers, but just incredible, incredible uh, leaders and advocates in our field. Um, I am going to start with Danielle Brazell, um, who I think needs little to no introduction to any of in our community, but Danielle is the general manager of the city of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. She reports directly uh, to the mayor of Los Angeles, Mayor Garcetti. Um, as you all know, she has incredible roots in um, in the arts and culture field, but also founded Arts for LA. Um, she is our founding executive director and um, it is solely to blame, I think, for building such an amazing community of, of arts advocates. Um, uh, our second presenter who will go right after Danielle um, is, is Tomas Benitez, uh, who is a fellow board member of Californians for the Arts. He is president of the Latino Arts Network of California, former executive director of Self-Help Graphics. I met Domas through, uh, through his leadership work uh, when he was arts commissioner of, um, uh, when he was the arts commissioner for the first district supervisor, Gloria Molina, and just an incredible fierce advocate, uh, just a, uh, an amazing, amazing leader in our field. And so you will hear from Daniel first, followed by Tomas, and then um, you will, lastly, uh, Cordelia Stell, who is our director of organizer of organizing at Arts for LA, will jump in to share our call to action, our local call to action. And our call to action is really rooted in trying to capture arts worker stories at this moment. And so with that, I will turn it over to Daniel. Thank you, Gustavo. And um, you know, I'm I'm having this moment where, um, my gosh, we got a hundred people on this webinar right now on this conversation, and not only that, but we have generational leadership in the room. And while I had the phenomenal opportunity to be Arts for LA's first executive director. It's only because I stood on the shoulders of the giants that went before me, Tomas Benitez, uh, Michael Alexander, Lenny Borston, who I think is on the call, Janice Pober, um, these, you know, and I'm, I'm gonna shout out to Victoria Hamilton, um, who's been doing statewide work for, for, for decades. And I just think that what you and your team in LA County have done, over this last year. Um, I got a shout out to Californians for the Arts. I mean, Julie Baker, you are a force lady. You are phenomenal. You know, one of the hardest things to do is to keep an advocacy effort going when there isn't a crisis. And what Arts for LA has done so effectively is you trained and have kept, you know, you've really looked at this in terms of field building. So you've been developing through the Activate program, this kind of well-oiled kind of um, voice um, that's rooted in real data. And I, I gotta just, you know, shout out also to Dallas Frank, who is um, here. Uh, and I think she's the auntie of one of Arts for LA's first intern. But Dallas is a LAUSD teacher and has been with Arts for LA since its inception. So again, you know, you have, we have an extraordinary village behind us. And the most amazing thing is that look at what it has brought. The advancement that we're seeing at the state, at the federal level, and at the local level. Look, there's no question, the city of Los Angeles, we are funded by tourism dollars. 
There's other cities too, like San Diego, San Jose, Oakland. We're all funded by tourism dollars. So we're a little, we're a little nervous. But on the flip side of that, is that I think that there's more support for arts, culture, and creativity in this day and age than we've ever seen. And that is where I think we can capitalize on this. We have done just really good, solid work in this space. And we've done it through this really delicate balance of inside out strategies. I'm currently in my position as a general manager of the city of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, but I come from the sector and I will always be an arts advocate. So my job is to make sure I can bring our city family into a solution frame. That means I need to position the mayor who has really tough choices to make to say, okay, if we can't, if I can't get you to commit to fulfilling our budget right now, let's see what we can do to help you dispatch your federal team to make sure that your voice as the second largest city in the country is in alignment with other voices, with other mayors pushing the Biden administration to make sure that the arts are included in the massive federal stimulus. And I'm really excited to know that it is. And it is because we're gonna get funding for revenue loss for cities, which is gonna help us backfill that loss of TOT. But it's also gonna come in terms of IMLS, NEA, state resources, et cetera. So we need to diversify that. The next piece is, is that there's gonna be a massive infrastructure bill that's gonna be coming down the pike. So we need to be thinking towards that um, every step of the way. Um, I wanna be mindful of the limited time that I have. There's a few things that I um, wanna just highlight. Um, but I just wanna make sure I'm touching all of my notes. Um, so, so one critical thing is to save our stages. Um, for those of you that are not aware of the Save Our Stages. We've done two webinars and I think we've got one more and our performing arts team will be here as part of technical assistance. You can reach out and I think we have uh, Ben Johnson, Nikki Genovese um, on the call today um, and Brenda Slaughter Runnels from DCA. Um, they can help you um, see if you're eligible and cook you up with the webinar, but there's money to be had and it's a prescriptive amount. So don't leave any dollar on the table. Um, uh, we also have some other emergency funds. Uh, we're currently doing a COVID Corona Memorial. It's a small grant program through our arts activation, but you can reach out to Ben Espinosa or go to our website for that. And then the final thing I'm gonna just say, and then I'll turn it over to Thomas, is that equity is a big issue. Um, and it's a really big issue in the city of Los Angeles in everything that we do. The Department of Cultural Affairs is a local arts agency. We provide grant funding for projects for over 300 arts and cultural organizations and artists. We're one of the few that still support artists. We also have an incredibly robust community arts program where we deliver um, high quality instruction um, in communities that have literally no other formal cultural infrastructure. So it's really the only place that you can get access to a free or reduced arts class. Um, so this is really, really essential to us. But the trick is, is that we need to make sure that we can demonstrate impact. And we, we know we serve close to 500,000 people through, through our programs, but I would ask you if you would please take a survey and help push out an audience participation and um, cultural services survey that we're doing. That'll help us build the data that we need to help advocate for, um, for more resources. And then the final thing I'll say is, is that TOT, look, we've known TOT hasn't met the need for our communities for ages. The department has always been structured around public art funding, TOT grant making funding, and then general fund operating support. But I think there really is a case to be made for the reappropriation of LAPD money that was taken from LAPD for policing, put that within the cultural frame for, for safety and other ways to achieve community safety. 
And then also CDBG, Community Development Block Grants. That's another important way in which we can um, support and fund programs that are specifically training the next generation of creative workers. Um, and we need their creative ideas. We need their innovation. We're leaving it on the table. So I'll put that in the chat and I'll stop here and hand it over to Tomas. Hey, Tomas, we need you to unmute. There, am I on? Yep, there you are. Uh, there's an old showbiz adage, which is never follow a dog act, uh, a, a, a kid, or Danielle Brazil. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna try. Um, Latino Art Network is, was essentially founded about 25 years ago to promote and uh, present Latino art, um, in essence, empowering the uh, Latino community through the presentation of the art, which we share for everybody. It's our gift to the American fabric. Um, and uh, uh, we were one of the, the brain children of uh, Barry Hesenius. Uh, uh, you remember Barry, um, when he created all these kind of pod um, uh, uh, advocacy groups, uh, we've survived uh, by being small, by, 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 by staying lean and, and small. Uh, but we've uh, sustained some programs that we, we have two, award programs, which is the Maestros, which recognizes unsung leadership in the Latino community, and the Catalyst, which is providing an opportunity for those, those leaders, those survivors, to come in and mentor um, uh, needs of, of the community uh, in different organizations. We pivoted those two last year to uh, break those awards up and use them more for um, uh, emergency relief for artists, because uh, we were besieged by artists saying, can you help me? I, you know, I can't pay my rent, uh, and and so for the present, we've done that. Uh, we also worked with a local beer company who needed us to help identify some Latino muralists, and so yes, we we went into the dark waters of working with an alcohol company, but we took that money and we put it into uh, supporting um, uh, uh, individual artists. Uh, uh, generally, the the ones that need, that come to us are the ones on the fringe that have nothing else, nowhere else to go. Um, we had to cancel our Latina Women's Conference, which has become a huge success because uh, of, of the cross-generational impact of, upon uh, supporting Latina women's in the state. Uh, but uh, we will be representing that in the fall uh, through a Zoom conference. And Lord knows what to expect, but I think it'll be wonderful. Um, we worked and partnered with our friends up in Sacramento at the Latino Center for the Arts and Culture with the uh, Artists in Actions uh, 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 project, which has become the prototype, really, for the uh, California uh, uh, project, uh, uh, Julia will confirm. Um, so we were very glad to partner with our friend, our, our, our beloved uh, board member and, 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 and uh, longtime advocate, uh, Marie uh, 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 Acosta up there. Um, um, we are now in the process, uh, you know, we, we have benefited from a lot of the work that Julie and CFTA and CAA have done and other organizations in terms of surveying the field and getting a sense of what's going on. But we felt the need to try to drill deep a little bit more because within the Latino communities, you will find that those organizations that have been those nexus, those centers have been many times more than just art and culture. Um, uh, and, and, and when the, when the pandemic hit, uh, many of them were launched into a profile of being, you know, a, 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 not just a second responder, but a, but a first neighbor and responding in a triage manner. And so we found that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, they were handing out masks and, 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 and serving as a conduit for communities that maybe um, one remain hidden or their monolingual Spanish speaking, but they'll come to like, let's say a Plaza de la Raza because they need help, they, they, they're looking for answers. Plaza, not, that's not their business, but they have a profile of being in the community and being trusted. So they basically go into a triage mode. So what we wanna do is, is survey the field, uh, taking a look at first with some of the major regional um, arts and cultural centers in the Latino community to drill deep and get a sense of, uh, build up some war stories and build up some experience in terms of that. I think you'll find that happened with a lot of other arts organizations that are not Latino throughout the state. But I know in particular from talking to our leadership and talking to our friends that that has occurred. Uh, um, and um, um, 
I, you know, fundamentally, it's, it's, it's based on the idea that arts heal. And when people come to these places, what they're coming for is enrichment and, and empowerment. But now in a crisis, they're coming for healing. Um, and, then, and then also we're gonna continue to sustain our pivot to try to reach out to, to uh, artists uh, that are on the fringe. In particular, what we're finding is the ones that are not getting in the fold of anything are the monolingual Spanish speaking or the primary Spanish speaking. And there's nobody there helping them. So that's our focus in terms of trying to make sure that we have a little bit of emergency. If it's 500 bucks to help pay for food, um, uh, we're repositioning our funding for these other awards. Although I will say in conclusion, um, we, we, the Maestro's Award has generally been given to unsung heroes. That, that, that's kind of a broad term. I mean, not as well known. I mean, we, we went from a lady who used to provide all the food for events at Centro Cultural in San Diego every year for 20 years, just came and did the catering for free out of her heart. You know, she, we also awarded to, to, to um, um, people that had a higher profile. But we're going to rename the award the Larry Bassa Maestros Award uh, in honor of, of, of our colleague and our, and our dear friend. Um, so that when we return to that award process in better times, it will be known as the Larry Bassa Award. So that's what we're doing. We, we, stand, we stand aligned and, 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 and with our allegiance to um, CFTA and CAA. It's my honor to be on the board and, and, and uh, how we can tether our effort. Because uh, we want to share the data that we get from the survey. We want to share the stories because we know that it will enrich the argument that we're making on the broader scale of what's going on with the art community. Uh, we, we will be, we will be uh, certainly willing and uh, able to uh, present that. Um, and uh, um, we recognize that when we do advocacy for uh, Latino arts and culture and community, we are advocating for our entire uh, arts and cultural community and audiences. And that's what we continue to do in our mission. So thank you for letting me take that time to bring you up to speed on what's going on with Latino Arts Network of California. Love you, Tomas. Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. uh, Gustavo, are you gonna say a couple words or? Where yes, are we? yes, yes. Very, okay, very quickly. Thank you, uh, Tomas, yeah. and, and thank you, Tomas, for, for, for your advocacy on behalf of the, the Latino uh, community. I, I want to just take a quick moment to, to kind of hit on something that both Danielle shared um, and then also Kristen shared, but there is the, the, there's the internal advocacy that is happening and there's the external advocacy that is happening. And I just wanna take a moment to thank all of you who are on this thread for all of the external advocacy that you continue to do every single day. Uh, it makes a huge, huge difference. And, and it's what, what has made things possible like the, the 12 million that uh, was um, allocated from CARES to the creative community it is, um, you know, it, it's, it's what's made all of these relief and recovery funds possible. And so thank you for your ongoing um, advocacy. Uh, you are a part of this external community um, that's doing both internal and external advocacy. But um, at this point, I think I just wanna turn it over to our brilliant and, and fearless uh, director of organizing at Arts for LA, uh, Cordelia Estelle, who's gonna share with you a little bit more about our local call to action here. Cordelia. Cool. Um, thank you guys all so much for being here. I'm, I'm just uh, so inspired by the work everyone is doing. Um, and yes, I'm gonna keep it short and sweet. This is a call to action. Um, as Gustavo has mentioned, you know, Arts for LA, we are the regional uh, arts advocacy organization. We are in the midst of developing and launching a campaign that is aimed at retaining and increasing the hyper-local funding sources that are critical to cultural equity. We know that these funding sources are often the first grants that emerging organizations get, that small to mid-sized organizations get. If they go away, a critical piece of our funding infrastructure is gone and it sets the culture, the fight for cultural equity back a decade. Um, and we know 
know that so often this may not look like a full department in some municipalities across the region. It may be a budget line in the arts and rec or the, the parks and rec department or the local library uh, budget. And so we are trying to equip all of you advocates with the tools uh, you need to be effective. Um, and that's going to look like social media assets, some talking points, some data points. Um, and then a key piece of that is your stories, right? So we want to put a face to the data that Julie has collected, that Danielle's team is collecting, that Kristen and the county are all collecting. We want to make sure we're telling the story of the work you are doing, of the work your organizations are doing. Um, so to do that, we've created a very simple Google form. Um, and we ask that you complete it, share a picture, share a quote, talk about how important these hyper-local funding sources are, spread them to your network of artists um, and organizations so that we can really clearly tell the story. So I just dropped those links in the chat. There's two forms, one for an individual artist. Here's what public funding has meant for my practice. Um, and then there's one for um, organizations as well. This is what this means for my organization and my community. Um, and then the second, the second call to action, that is so important. We, 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 we have to tell this story at the local level um, and we need your help to do so. We wanna uplift the work you have been doing throughout these um, incredibly challenging months. Um, and again, sorry, I'll just say one thing before I pivot. Um, is the moment is critical right now because our local funding cycles are happening now at the municipal level and at the county level, as well as the federal stimulus money coming down, hopefully, right? Um, so we have to position ourselves. We need to be on the forefront of our local leaders' minds um, as artists, as our sector. Um, and so to do that, we need to tell the story of the work that you are all doing in the communities. And that's why this moment is just so critical. And we ask for your help in collecting these stories and uplifting them and amplifying them. The second piece, and I want to also just say uh, so many people on the call were at our first ever uh, monthly community action meeting last uh, month in which so many of you gave us invaluable feedback in terms of messaging, what's going to resonate in your community with your local leaders. Um, and that has all been rolled up into a toolkit and campaign that we are going to talk about this Wednesday at our second community action meeting. Um, so I'm going to drop the link to that in here. Um, it's 6 p.m. on Wednesday the 10th, and we ask that you come. This is where we're going to get really rubber meets the road about advocacy. Here's the toolkit. Here's our goal for how many um, pings we want to get to our different electives, right? We're really going to sort of get into the nitty gritty um, of how we can make an impact and make sure the arts are meaningfully considered at the local level as these funding decisions are happening over the coming months. So um, we ask that you come to, to that space um, to really, again, rubber meets the road. Let's go. Um, and invite as many folks from your community as well. We wanna make sure we are representing the entire geographic region. Um, and so we wanna just make, it's really open invitation. Everyone is welcome at that meeting to take action in support of our arts um, and culture communities. Um, and I think that does it for me. Uh, is there a visual flyer or info? Um, we will Thank be you. sure to Ooh. Awesome. Go ahead and why don't you respond in the chat? I see Dan. Thank you so much, Cordelia. She is an amazing um, uh, firebrand advocate and leader. And you guys are so lucky to have incredible regional advocacy in LA and Arts for LA. And uh, one of the things I just want to add to what she's saying is that how critically important it is if we ask, if advocacy organizations are asking for your stories, asking you to do surveys, it is not because we need something to do. It is because we know that this is critically important for us to move the needle in terms of actually making things happen to get you the funding, to get you the resources and for our voices to be heard. So please, when we put these things out, take five minutes to fill them out and it will, I trust that it will be used well. So Danielle, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to surface that the mayor's state of the city um, will take place uh, the second or third week of April and the budget will be released immediately after that. The departments and most departments will get the budget the night before. So we have a real challenge because we simply don't, we can't plan. Um, and the stimulus money that will be coming down will likely backfill revenue loss. So that if TOT came in at 40% of what it was or what they were projecting, right? That TOT is gonna backfill this year. We don't know what is gonna be for next year. I am really hopeful that with the vaccine distribution that we are, we, we are starting to see light at the end of the tunnel. 
and the um, the the real focus on you know highlighting that if you cut anything of the Department of Cultural Affairs, you're going to be cutting really our equity programs, right? These are the very programs they're going to hit our artists of color and our communities of color disproportionately. But it's also going to kick us in terms of accelerating accelerating regional recovery because we know that the arts are going to be critical for that. That argument seems to really be working. And you know, I say lean into that. And you know, as soon as we know, um, you all will know within minutes. That's terrific. Well, I want to thank all of our um, local speakers, regional speakers um, for joining us today and giving us the report and hopefully inspiring everyone here to engage in advocacy if you're not already. Um, I know sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, you're asking me to do one more thing today um, after all the other stuff that I'm doing. But I can assure you, um, for those of us who do the direct lobbying and advocacy, how critically important it is for your legislators, your local elected officials to hear from you. I, I've said this uh, for those on our team, they hear me say this every time, which is that if they don't know that there's a problem, they're not going to solve it for you. So we have to tell them that there are problems and we have to give them options in terms of solutions. And, uh, and that's our job as your frontline work, workforce for that. But your job is to help us to do that um, with giving us the data and um, the stories. And one of the things that's so effective is art to tell stories. Um, and sometimes, you know, we just, we tend to ask you to act like us, which is to sound like a policymaker. We don't want to do that. We want you to tell your story through your practice. Tell us uh, through poems, tell us through film, tell us through dance, tell us through visual art. Um, of what is the impact of the arts. Um, and that we find is actually gonna be make us stand out, particularly to those policymakers that are hearing from everybody right now. Um, so now's the time for really just to engage in conversation. Um, we have uh, still around 80 people here on the call. I can't see all of you. Unfortunately, my screen's not large enough for that. Um, but I would love to invite you into the conversation. So here's a chance to either ask any of us questions, to clarify some of the things that we talked about, to bring up issues that we have not mentioned um, and that are of critical importance to you as the state and regional advocacy organizations. This is also how we can listen and learn uh, about what's happening in the state and lift that up in our own advocacy. So um, you can either raise your hand or um, just interrupt me from talking because you don't want to hear me anymore. Um, so tell me, yeah, who's who's got something to, in, let's join in the conversation. Jim, I see your hand and then we'll go to Jackie after that. That's who I see so far. Thank you. Um, and sorry, I couldn't figure out how to do the thing on Zoom. And you would think after a year, we would all be experts. But um, this, Danielle, this is kind of a question for you and, and other of the, the government people on the, on the call, if, they, if you have any ideas. Um, you mentioned a, you know, some really kind of um, opportunities for additional funding for the department, but is the department at risk for, from other things? Um, I was particularly thinking about TOT and is that something that could be put on the block um, either in whole or in part to be used as, you know, getting rid of it as an incentive to bring people um, to the city? Um, I'm just curious, you know, are there threats that we need to be looking at? Um, hi, Jim, it's so good to see your face. And you can too. I just also just lift you up because Jim Herr, when he was at Boeing, um, came in and um, with, a, with a pretty extraordinary grant and support offer um, for Arts for LA. And that really helped to legitimize us and give us new credibility and catalyze us. Um, so thank you for um, always thinking strategically and ahead. And I will say you're absolutely right. You know, the city relies on TOT. There's 14% that's generated through TOT. That's every time a visitor stays in a hotel under 30 days, there is a tax on the rate of that hotel. So if it's 150 bucks, an expensive hotel for some, then 14% gets tacked onto that. 1% is supposed to come to cultural affairs, 1% goes to the Visitors and Convention Bureau, and 12% goes to backfill, is, is really revenue for the city. 
So there is, we are, we are linked with tourism. Tourism understands that. Adam Burke, uh, so, so Kristen and I, and all of our municipal arts leaders, and I, I know that Rochelle um, from uh, Pasadena and Eve Rappaport from um, Torrance were gonna be on the call, but we work pretty closely. Um, so Kristen and I meet with the Visitors and Convention Bureau pretty regularly, and we're kind of on the same page. And I will say that the new CEO is a self-identified um, thespian geek. Um, so we share that, um, and he shares the important role that the arts play. But the challenge is, Jim, is that the city is making labor agreements that we have no control over. So we just had, we just lost nine senior staff members, basically, with, you know, over 30 years of being with the city, our entire contracting unit uh, left due to early retirement. So we'll see things, and, and we were cut up right now 6%. And as we move into the next budget, we're gonna get cut another 3%. And if we get out with that 9% reduction, we'll be feeling pretty good because we're trying to retain staffing and we're trying to retain programs because those are gonna be the hardest to get back. And as Julie pointed out, you know, this is why I'm so thrilled with the regional conversations and this incredible advocacy um, um, uh, group I, I'm trying not to use military terms, um, force that you've all created, that you're all a part of, um, because this is not going to be 2004 when we save the Department of Cultural Affairs but lost the state of California. So I, I don't know. Did I answer your question? We've got a bunch of other questions, so I'm going <laughs> to jump jump ahead if that's okay. We got a lot of people with our case. hands up, and I know Jim and and um, and uh, Danielle can also talk offline, so I want to make sure their voice, voices are heard too. So I think Jackie, you were next, Jackie Malou, and yeah. then we'll go to Giuliano and Nancy Nyberg after that. Aho, uh miigwech, all my relations. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for the land acknowledgement, um, and my question is for Danielle and Julie. Um, so the incredible fire from the artistic um, energy of all the ancestors of everyone on this call is clearly here. What is being done and what can be done with these organizations and the city to bridge a way to anchor all of this flame in the belly so that in this incredible time of opportunity, we are harnessing not only the force of our creativity, but the force of the spirit of the land of California and Turtle Island. We have a, this is a, mm -hmm. um, a material problem, but there is a spiritual solution that many of us in the arts, particularly as BIPOC storytellers are bringing down into the room in a Eugene O'Neillian way, right? So there's a lot of fire. Oh my gosh, it's all happening. We heard it today. How is this being grounded in the ceremony of theater and in mm -hmm. the ceremony of the culture of this city and this state. Yeah. Because I think that there are forces that we can harness with that can help our work be more effective so that we don't have to work so hard and so fast. If you could speak to that for a second, I would appreciate it at home and watch all my relations. Danielle, you're, you're leaning in and I have something well, to add up for you, go. Yeah, so I wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for lifting that up. We are not, we in the arts are in the business of transformation. We are not in the business of transaction. And how we need our artists as healers, we need to heal the centuries of um, horrific violence that we have um, put upon our fellow human beings. I will tell you that there is a civic memory working group in the city of Los Angeles that there will be a, there's movement and there's phenomenal leaders and thinkers that have been working on this for over a year. That will come out, I think in April. I think they're just putting the finishing touches on it. Um, as part of that, I think we're really gonna be looking at truth and reconciliation in a pretty powerful way. Um, so that that's, I'm holding that. I also wanna just lift up and say that um, early in the pandemic, our public art team in partnering with, with a few council offices um, put out about $340,000 to, to allow artists to offer us a piece of work. And that, that work could be new or it could be something that really speaks to this moment in this history. 
Uh, so we've collected over 250 works, uh, multidisciplinary from all, all aspects of all parts of our city. Um, and that's gonna be coming up on a, a pretty robust um, online exhibition. Tanya Picasso from our public art team has been leading that project um, in partnership with our public art director is phenomenal. But this is the moment where we need to be able to demonstrate, here's how we heal our city. And it's not just because of a global pandemic, it's because of the generations that we've had. Um, and that you are the ones that can help bring us to, um, to this moment of reconciliation, of acknowledgement, of being seen, of witnessing by lifting up. So I, those are a few things, more needs to be done. Julie. And Jackie, I'm just gonna say two things. One is that, and really I think that there's a moment right now in terms of redefining and reimagining culture, the Calif what is California culture, yeah. without the, the, the sort of thread of like celebrity and Hollywood, but truly who can we, what, what can we celebrate here? And I think that this moment with the, with the emphasis on racial equity and getting to cultural equity through this racial equity, where we tell these stories that have not been told um, is an exciting moment for what could be the WPA for the 21st century, right? This is what could be truly a definition of what is the new California culture. I'm only talking about California in this case, because that's the only, you know, programs that we're working on. In addition, I think that there's a really important thread between protection of natural resources and cultural resources. And I think when we start to work across sector and start to think about how can we work with those organizations as well, there is not much we were going to be able to do in terms of supporting our plan. If we don't support our plan at first, we won't have the storytelling you know, capabilities anyway. So it's like there is this really connection that we need to make between climate change and protection of natural resources and protection of cultural resources. And I think there's a real opportunity there also in terms of um, funding in, in, a, in a new way of looking at dedicated funding for arts and culture resources, which I won't go into now because we wanna to get to other people's questions, but Jackie, thank you so much for lifting that up. So um, before there's Juliano, Nancy, Amy, and proud Asian um, woman. I wanna get to all four of you before quickly I do. I just wanna mention, because some people asked in the chat around um, some of the AB5 follow-up bills, and there are two this year, as Senate Bill 805 and Assembly Bill 1227. I'm not gonna go into great detail about those. It's early in the bill language, but we are looking at them. They are looking at, on one hand, protecting or um, getting exemptions for arts organizations under a certain budget size to be exempt from AB5 and still go back to Borello. In another case, they're trying to say that anyone who works in seasonal performing arts would be an independent contractor and the test again would be Borello. A lot too much detail to go into now. Deborah and others who've reached out, please feel free to reach out to me via phone or email to learn more. All right, Giuliano. Good afternoon, all. Thank you all for setting this table where we can all gather and share. Uh, muchas cosas buenas for all, just m many blessings and greatness your way. Um, Native Angelino grew up here, grew up in Compton, but moved out to educate myself, but came back home. We're actually trying to understand the conversations related to healing. We're working with a lot of community members that have businesses for multi-generationals. Y muchas de estas personas, many of these peoples are native speakers of Spanish. So transitioning to the newer generation. Uh, thank you to Tomas that we spent a lot of time in the Boyle Heights area, but trying to find avenues to maintain the emphasis on art rather than recovery. But we're noticing the importance of healing through art, but there's so many regulatory requirements and mandated standards, policies, procedures, Jayco OSHA, um, trying to find ways to bring circles together. We are doing it here, but I want to bang the drum with you guys and create bigger vibrations. Don't know the proper way of doing that, but deseo abrir la puerta, want to open the door to come in and ebb and flow. Um, there's a group of six of us that are mental health workers. I'm a psychiatrist, but I don't take the test because I'm an artist, not a doctor. So that's where I'm struggling, but we're working to address a lot of the needs and 
want to find a way to stay connected with at least five of you here, you know, a minimal statistical number. Julie, thank you for this, but want to really talk to your heart more than our heads because we're seeing a lot of abuse, abuse going on and we're noticing the arts are helping heal. And I'm going to start crying, but got to keep this message going because people are eager to find that healing power but we're also dealing with the regulatory standards the epidemic um i know i'm mumbling pero quiero conectar i want to connect with a few of you before this meeting i had a blessing to just talk with tomas but we're writing grants where we never asked for money but now with the change we're trying to figure out how to continue to add value and maintain so would love your direction all I'm worried about your hearts and space. You know, self-care is essential because we're trying to keep that sphere to penetrate. Pero nos tenemos que cuidar. We got to heal. So looking for a little love our way, we'll give it back, but just trying to keep that love flowing and going. So thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you all for what you do. Thank you. And thank you for those words of wisdom. And we like to say artists are our second responders, right? Like you are... You're not going into a burning building, saving a life, but you are right there rebuilding the life. And I think that that is exactly what we we try to uplift in our work on a daily basis. I invite you to reach out to me. Um, my information's in the chat and I uh, would love to connect with you. And don't talk to me about, I'm gonna start crying for goodness sake, talking about my heart, that will, I'll go there anytime. So thank you so much for um, lifting that up and, and, and joining us in conversation. I want to um, invite Nancy Nyberg into the conversation as well. Nancy, you had your hand up. There I am. Yes. There you are. Sorry about that. I do want to thank everyone for being on the call and for everyone's wonderful ideas. Mine is simple. I know we've been talking about recognition of the arts, recognition of our space, recognition of our state. And what if we simply try to get back to some basics, even the art in the basement, shall we say. Things like the SEDA and the WPA model that we keep talking about. Can we restore models? Can we restore tile work? Can we paint a bus bench? Are there things that we can do to bring art into individual communities where even kids might be involved, not in painting the bus bench, but maybe designing it as a class project? or a contest, even the recognition, not a $75 prize like you know we have that model of, but just the chance to be involved and drive by and say, I helped do that. So are there things also in the basement that might help fund these? Maybe some piece of art that's become valuable over time. I've had a conversation with a few people in this Zoom room saying, are there things that have become valuable or might be on exhibit again? They're relevant that were created long ago. Let's bring the arts to the fore. And in the meantime, see what we can do to cre create even gentle, low cost work. And I do think there was a good point. You know, I don't want it to become mired in, oh, it's gotta be this certain type of latex paint the last 25 years, but not in the California sun, but isn't toxic, but you know, so I'm not trying to make it complicated. I'm trying to make it simple. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for sharing. And uh, yeah, in terms of regulations, that actually came up on the Otis panel we were on as well. And I think it's important that we understand specifically what we were talking about when you're talking about sort of think barriers that you're experiencing to be able to bring your art to communities. And if there is very specific things, you should share that both with us and Arts for LA because that really does help to inform, you know, that those could be spe very specific policy changes that we could look to to make sure that arts are more inclu included. Um, it looks like next on the list is Amy Erickson. I invite you into the conversation. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Julie. Um, and I appreciate all the comments today and um, really they're flowing in the same direction, I really feel. Um, and it just started with Kristen talking about arts money coming back from other sectors um, with the Arts Relief Fund, but all the way down to how do we get the money right to those projects that Nancy and Juliano and, and all these folks are talking about? And I think there's some key money that's been sitting on that California table for a while around cultural district funding and um, cultural district funding can go straight to an artist. Like that's why we, I think, designated state cultural districts is 
that they're working closely with artists right there in their own area. And so I'm just gonna uplift this again. Gustavo and Cordelia have heard this from me. I think you've heard this from me, Julie, but I think it's important that we, um, I know the creative core is a really great idea and the WPA model is a really awesome plan, but if we could also try and respond to keeping that funding there to get it right into the districts for projects, just like Nancy was just talking about, um, it would be really helpful. So I, I'd be interested to hear about, about any ideas in that. Sure. Part. Thank you, Amy. I think it's, um, you're not the only person who, who reminds us of the cultural districts program. Um, as many of you know, that was something that the legislature actually created. Um, Rich assembly member Richard Bloom authored it and um, from Santa Monica area. And um, it was uh, piloted in the California Arts Council. Um, communities were given, I think $10,000 over two years, which is a very small, it was five per year. So 10 over two years, I think, very small amount of money to get it going. Um, and then essentially nothing has has come since then. Um, in the beginning of 2020, Governor Newsom did introduce $9 million for the cultural districts program, and then COVID hit and that was taken off the table. What we are looking at right now, that dollar for the arts program that Sharon Quirk Silva, Silva assembly members introduced in a budget ask, is something that we're gonna ask for your support to, uh, to create, which means that the overall budget for the California Arts Council could go from 26 million in funds currently to $40 million in funds, which would right. be a dollar per person in the state of California. Um, and that then they can make decisions and your advocacy could help them to determine those decisions on how those funds get spent. And so you could then, if we increase the pot, which is what we all need to do, increase the pot so more arts can get funded, more artists can get funded and may make a living wage at their work, um, that's gonna be really critically important. But thank you for again, for, reminding, for the reminder on that. And I can I just so add to yeah. that, Julie? Um, we have a resolution um, that I think I shared with you, which is really to have city council endorse additional funding from the state and feds. So it just helps to tee up through the city side because you manage a facility um, that is on RAP, Rec and Parks land, but it is a cultural organization. So right. how do we make sure that we're growing the pie and, and how do we position city council to be squarely behind our arts and cultural sector, at least in terms of advocating for state and federal. So I can put that resolution in the chat as well. Um, I think it's currently in the rules committee, but uh, uh, Arts for LA is on it, I believe. Yeah, and I, 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 can, hear quickly, I can quickly add, we're, we're, we're working to, to agendize that resolution. Our hope is that you know we get that on a city council agenda, and as soon as that happens, we'll put put out a big call to action because public support, public comments will be critical to ensuring that um, that council uh, hear, hears from us on this. Absolutely. Thank you all. Yeah, and again, it's it's just so critical. I know that we're dwindling down in numbers, people to get to their other um, meetings, but please do impart to people that when you hear from your local, regional, state advocacy organizations, federal advocacy organizations with action items and action alerts. Again, it's not because we want to prove our worth. It's because we really think that it's going to make a difference in terms of the direct lobbying that we're doing. And we're hearing from legislators. They, you know, again, they will often say to us in one-on-one -on -one meetings, well, Julie, we're not really hearing from the arts. And it's like someone just put a knife in my heart that you were talking about, Juliano. And so, so <laughs> let's make sure that that is not what's happening if you can get a chance to lift your voice up for the arts. And I, I want to, um, Danielle wants to say something. And then I'm I want to so go to sorry. I just, Yeah, just because I'm on the inside, the amount of, uh, we need to hear from the arts. And the way we hear from the arts is different than any other sector. And every other sector is very loud. So what is it the way that we need to get our voices heard in this moment of saturation? Sorry, I'm gonna be quiet. Don't be quiet. Your voice is really important. It's and man, so man, very important. Yeah, but I wanna, um, because um, her hand has been up for a while, proud Asian uh, woman with an X, please join the conversation. Hi, Julie. Hi, Danielle and Arts for LA, everyone. My name is Jeannie. My pronouns are she, her, they, them. And um, this is my first time kind of joining in an Arts for LA combo. And I am very 
proud that there is intergenerational representation here. And Jackie, what you said about, you know, really honoring indigenous land. Um, and um, I'm learning a lot. I, a little bit about myself. I'm an artist, a curator, and a community organizer. I've been organizing community outside of Chinatown in a gallery called News Choose, but it closed, I folded during the pandemic. And um, I've been navigating this art space, creative economy all by myself. And I, I, I don't know how to ask for help. I don't even know what I need, but I need money. And I represent a group, Proud Asian Woman. Um, I started this group in 2019 because I was a victim of a hate crime. And I had nowhere to go to talk about my, my experience. No one, no one was, no one cared. No one cared. Cause they were like, well, you're, I'm not gonna get into that, but I needed a space. So I created a space called Pride Asian Woman. And our very first meeting, we had 50 people come from Anaheim to Lancaster to this gallery in Chinatown, just to talk about our unique oppression. And our unique oppression is our invisibility. I mean, just look at this room. Out of 62, there's only one Asian person here. So I hear you about saying, hey, come and, and, and fill these surveys and such, but there's also like, where are you meeting, where are you meeting my community halfway? You know what I'm saying? So um, Juliano, I really resonated with your passion there about this healing. Right now, my community, we, there's been such a backlog of, of pain and rage. Um, and now it's just kind of bleeding all over. And I live in K-Town. K-Town is one of the most diverse like cities, neighborhoods in LA. There's Latino community and, and the history of, you know, 92 riots. And now there's a, an influx uh, or there's a, a Bangladeshi community too. And there are no art spaces, no public spaces here. And um, I'm wondering like, how have any of y'all reached out to K-Town? I'm sorry, this, there's, I'm just very just like passionate about this because API women are one of the highest, have one of the highest rates of depression and suicide of all ethnic groups in the US. And, and we're also the less likely to reach out for help. And I, that's why I'm here. Cause I'm like, I need to advocate for my people. Not only advocate for my people, advocate for K-Town, for LA cause I'm a proud Angelino. And I, I know all of y'all are really proud Angelinos too. That's why you're here. And I don't know, I, I'm kind of just like, where do I start? I'm gonna fill out the survey. I'm gonna talk, tell you about what's going on in my community, but I, I, I have you no- You started here, you started yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. this yeah. is great. Thank you for, for speaking up and for joining. And, and I'm, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just wanted to say thank you. And this is where it starts. This is why we're doing these conversations because we don't know how to reach out to everybody. We all desperately try to be proactive. We're a tiny budget arts organization ourselves. I'm the only full-time person for the entire state for arts advocacy. Um, so we're all doing our best here, but it is, and I'm, that's not trying to make an excuse. I think what you said is really, really critically important. And that's all I can say right now in terms of response. And I would hope that we can continue the dialogue and understand I, and how we can support you. And I know Danielle and Gustavo want to respond as well. Yeah, and, and I hear there's an urgency in this room. And I just want to say like, I know there's money, there's urgency, but everything gets taken care of in nature in its own perfect time, right? And I want to make sure everybody gets everybody in this very delicate ecosystem of LA. We're talking about equity, cultural equity, racial equity. It's a very nuanced conversation. Urgency is going to kill the nuances of that. We need to. I'm saying like, and and, and I, I and I honor what you're doing here. This is this is this is what we're doing. Yeah. Um, Proud woman, this is Giuliano. I just shot you my number and I'm in K-Town at least once or three times a month eating chili fries. So we'll connect. I shot you my number and I do a lot of mental health work out there. So we got you, girl. Cool, yeah. And you talk, and when you talked about tourism, this is like, this is the spot people come out to eat. Like all the K-Barbecue spots are still open. But yeah, I don't know that I, 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 I don't feel very heard and represented, you know, in the art space. Yeah. And, and Jacqueline, just, just want to jump in. Um, want you to know that Arts for LA is your... It's Jeannie, it, sorry. Yeah. What's that? It's Jeannie. Jeannie, Jeannie, I'm so sorry. Jeannie, I want you to know Arts for LA is, is your family. Is your, the, you, are, you are us, so reach out to us. Um, we'll make sure to send you our direct information too. 
we want to be as supportive as possible and we want to work with you also to engage the K-Town community in our work. Your voice is so critical, it's so important. If you look at our 2021 uh, priorities, it's really about centering voices just like yours. Um, and because your voice is so, so important to the future um, and to the now of, of arts and culture advocacy. And so please, uh, I'll reach out directly, but you know, connect with us. We've got a meeting upcoming on next Wednesday. Please join us, be a part of that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll find a way to really, really, um, really collaborate with you. And so thank and you for sharing everything you just did. Sorry, I just wanted to jump in really quickly too, because exact, that's why we're having the second monthly community meeting. And I think I wanna share this with you and, and everyone on the call, also recognizing that it can be hard, you know, so much of this is happening in professional capacity time. Like we are showing up in professional capacities. And so that's what the community action meetings are really, really aimed at doing is making sure that folks can show like from all parts of community can show up after conventional or, you know, nine to five work hours, really making sure we're providing as many ways to plug in as possible. Um, so please, um, I'll reach out as well, but the community action meetings for the region are um, exactly designed to make sure that that the work you are doing is being supported by the larger community as well. So I, I hate to be the taskmaster. Um, and again, Jeannie, thank you for, for that takes a lot of courage also. So thank you for, for doing that today and sharing that with us. And uh, I hope, I'm glad you felt safe to do that. And I, I think that's really critically important as well in terms of our work here. Uh, there are four more people with their hands up. I can spend uh, a little bit more time. I'm happy to stay. If you can't stay, I totally respect that you need to leave, but I'm happy to stay another 15 minutes. We do have a couple more polls, I think it looks like maybe. Um, so Louise Reichlin, you have your hand up. And welcome to the conversation, please. Yeah, let, let me, the poll is right in front of me right now. Okay, the, I wanted to respond to Asian woman. Um, and also another thing that I found out recently, I was very excited that our district, which is 13, CD 13, Mitch's district, finally was lowering the uh, bar for asking for help for businesses that you no longer had to have employees. And because we have independent contractors, we've been at, we've been out of almost everything having to do with county and city. And I found out at the very last minute after I'd already applied that they dropped my application because we donate our office space, it's donated. So we're in a house and I found out that we don't have a storefront and we are not eligible for that grant for a business in his CD district because we don't have a storefront and we're not on commercial property. So I just wanted to say to Asian woman, you, it sounds like you have commercial property. Your CD office, if you're in 13, they have money. But uh, we were knocked out because I just real, I never really realized that we're not commercial. That's all. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for that. And that is another important understanding of some of the regulations or some of the criteria that are and where is the gap in terms of who's not getting um, support and funding? And that is important for us to hear and understand. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I, next up is Joshua Lamont. Hello. Hi. So I, I just really quickly, I wanted to, uh, I'm looking at myself well. <laughs> um, I, wanted, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the connection between mental health and and the arts and wondering if there are any, is, is there any movement bet uh, between city departments, between county departments on, on, on working together to, to, to access mental health dollars, right? And public health dollars and, 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 and collaborate with uh, the DCA, collaborate with uh, 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 the, the county. Can I hit that? So, um, so I, I don't know if we have anybody from our county team, but this is where, and this is why organizing is so crucial because LA County runs mental health and the public health department and the city is just 4 million people and the county has 88 other cities, right? Long Beach, Culver City, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of our jurisdictions kind of divide us in a way because 
we don't have the um, mechanism to be able to provide um, resources specifically for, um, can, we, we, we don't have the ability to get resources from public health or mental health, but the county is doing extraordinary work on that. And they've been, they've been chipping away. So I just wanted to lift up the County Department of Arts and Culture and see if anybody could speak to, oh, look, Leticia uh, with Creative Strategist. So maybe Leticia, you can uh, flip your old hat and speak to some of the work you did um, when you were at the, at the County Department. <laughs> um, sure, it's been a couple of years and I would never speak on behalf of my colleagues, but I can definitely share previously of some of that work. And um, the cross-sector work, which is kind of what it's popularly called, is critical. And the reality is there's lots of funding in other places that isn't specific to arts and culture. And one of the biggest things I think is the opportunity for us to redefine ourselves as arts and arts organizations and find those entry points into places like um, public health, mental health, Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. There's money for small business and arts and um, entrepreneurs and anybody that is an artist and anybody that runs a small arts organization is both of those things. So um, I would recommend the alleycountyarts.org website. If you go to it, there are a variety of different places. There's this phenomenal work that's happening with um, addressing restorative um, practices for youth. Um, and that started at the state level, but it's also been happening here in LA, in LA County. And so you, you will find that the LA County Arts website is actually a really solid resource for that kind of information. Um, I am happy to, I'll put my contact in there and be a connector to, to my colleagues over there, um, but um, really, really critical. And I will say that our elected officials, at least specifically thinking about it from the county perspective is looking at ways in which to support the intersection of government and the arts. Absolutely, and just on the state level, Joshua, very similar conversations and at the federal level as well. I was just on a call today where we're, we're actually gonna likely be in a conversation with CDC and the intersection of how can artists be impacting what's going on in terms of public health in specific forms right now. And that is actually the California Creative Corps pilot program, specifically in terms of public health messages, but in terms of mental health, trauma, PTSD, there's also a tremendous amount of programs, arts and veterans um, that have been wildly successful and we have so much data that can prove that there is such an important relationship between our sectors. And, and at, let's be honest, we're in a larger mental health crisis than ever before. We were in one before COVID, it's even heightened now. So I think that, you know, I, I think that making that is, that's part of why our narrative often is that artists are second responders to make that direct con connection to how we can really be of service in that way and part of the solution. Um, although, you know, I, and then I think it goes back to what Dan Danielle said, which is arts is, are transformative and not transactional. And I think that that's, you know, often as a sector, we have led with the, the economic impact data, which is really important in terms of getting attention. And it is important in terms of jobs and everything else. And we are a labor force and we are a workforce. And that's also really important. But I think the unique piece of what we can offer is something that we also need to lead with. Um, uh, okay, we have a couple more hands up and I've got 10 more minutes. So I'm willing to stay because I just like, I had no idea LA was just so just there. This is a really ripe conversation. We've done, I think seven or eight of these across the region and you guys are just showing up in such a beautiful way. I really appreciate it. Ben Donenberg. For LA. <laughs> ben Donenberg. Hi, I'm Ben. My pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, and want to thank everybody this is an encouraging and inspiring phone call to or a zoom call to have everybody on and i think it's critical that we continue to talk like this because it's really um a great way to share and be together i just wanted to say that I, i'm taking a little bit of exception to the notion of the work i do as being a second responder um i think there are two i, I look at it this way there are two questions one of them is how do we go forward and, and, and you need money to go forward. So that's important, but you also have to answer the question, why go forward? And that's what we do. And that's not a secondary question to me. So I just wanted to express my support for this and how great it all is, but to say that I don't really 
consider my work and what I do second. I think the reason why I appreciate that and it's important for us to hear that. Um, I think why it, part of it is that first responders are a very clear category um, in terms of, you know, police, fire, um, rescue, uh, that's, that is what it's called. And so we just, we want to be respectful of, of those, of those types of, um, services. Um, but I understand where you're coming from as well. So I thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have to accept, I, I don't accept that. I'm not a part of that category. All right. Well, that, right on. I appreciate that. Uh, Jacqueline puppet master, you're, you please join the conversation. Thank you. How can I team up with some nonprofits who are applying for these grants uh, who, like I see these grants available all the time, but there's no way that I can apply for them because I am not specifically an arts organization. However, I created uh, Puppet Master Productions and, because, and I went to school for data and technology because I believe that's truly the way that we're going to save the arts. And I want to reach out and help. I don't qualify to help myself. Um, how can can I reach out to these people who are applying for grants to help them? Uh, before the pandemic, I was attending, or, and I still am now, I'm attending all of these different uh, meetings, and I hear them all trying to do the same thing. Like for uh, uh, the CAC, people were taking $10,000, and they all wanted to create a website that would house all of the arts programs available in Los Angeles. But now that that was the main initiative for the LA Alliance of Us, the stage, uh, there's so many, I forget but they're called, um, but there, there are so many and they're all trying to do the same thing. How can we make sure that we're all on the same page so that we're not all wasting, uh, not wasting, but not we're more properly allocating the grant money uh, and teaming up together so that it goes further. Cause I, I, like I'm seeing it even now where I'm helping, uh, you know, certain agencies with something that I'm already helping someone else with and it seems like a waste of money. And I know I should just take the money and be like, hey, but it's really not going to help anyone else or promote the arts itself. If we could, if there was a way to sign up on all of these grants pages, like I'm interested in working on this, here are some of the ideas that I have. Now, how do I get in contact with all the other people who are landing on this site? Because I guarantee that if you checked Google Analytics, how many people are actually looking at these opportunities and going, oh, I don't qualify, or how am I gonna do that? Or I don't have two years of programming, um, or I don't have a full portfolio, I don't have this much money. How do we team up together, I think, so that we can propel ourselves forward? Yeah, yeah, to share resources and to have more of that shared impact model, uh, it sounds like what you're talking about. Um, I don't know, do, do some of the funders on the call have any concepts around that? Um, Danielle, do you have any thoughts on that yet? Or Yeah, I mean, I think that this is part of the um, challenge with our arts ecosystem. Um, the, you know, the city has, uh, and, and, you know, for every dollar that is awarded, there needs to be a very, um, you know, uh, there needs to be a clear process that gets approved by legal and you know that 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 is uh, if it's a, if it's a public dollar going to a contractor then the contractor has to meet a certain level of um, standards for those services and the city does not gift public funds so so the challenge is is that that becomes then a barrier what and a barrier to entry so so if we're looking at equity as a driver, how do we reduce the barrier to services and service delivery? I wanna um, just, I put it in the chat and I can put it in again, but one of the best ways is to um, look at the Arts Activation Fund, which we've reappropriated for COVID memorials. And that gives you the opportunity to apply successfully for a micro award. Um, and then it gets you up into the hopper. What, what that, that question is not answering, that answer isn't answering your question because what I think you're asking is how do we create a system change within grant making itself? And that I think is a much bigger conversation because, because yeah, it would make a lot of sense for public agencies and private entities to say, 
we're going to put out a call for an initiative. And maybe that initiative is some sort of centralized promotional entity that can promote the nonprofit arts and cultural sector of Los Angeles. And then people can identify from there who, who's interested in applying and then who could potentially collaborate. That would be a phenomenal inversion of our existing systems, which I, I think is, you know, it, it takes artists to look at a system and say, why don't we, why are we doing it this way? We need to do it a different way. Yeah, and I, I can echo that in our own uh, racial and cultural equity committee work, we are actually talking about this. We are looking at it and we're trying to see what research is out there and to understand, you know, what, what what if we turned everything upside its head and, and try to look at it from different ways? So thank you, Jacqueline, for lifting that up. I'm sorry we don't have all the definitive answers here today, but certainly we'll keep we'll all keep working towards that. And um, it's 2.44. We've got 14 minutes over. I see Michael Alexander has his hand up, so I want to- And Tomas. And so does Tomas. And, oh, I'm sorry, Tomas. I, I've been just looking. I don't see all the faces. I just see the hands on the side there. So um, either one of you, take it away. Tomas. I'm going to defer to Tomas because I think his hand went up when Jacqueline was asking her question. So I, 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 I wanted to just go back to Joshua for a second. Um, I, I have the pleasure of working with the USC Keck Hospital right now. We're developing a pilot program that's taking a look. I'm dusting off my old teatro uh, uniform. Uh, we're going to be creating a teatro version of health education in the barrio that is looking at, uh, in particular, health issues. Uh, seeking out support for COVID relief, COVID vaccination, and above all, mental health, because the Latino community does not seek out services for mental health. And so we need to create this Teatro uh, uh, Chicano Street Agitprop Theater vehicle that's going to go around messaging, you know, how to get help, uh, how not to be afraid of the of the of the institutions. You're not going to get your Mika pulled um, to to come to us in English or in Spanish, and to seek out mental health. Because what we know, what we all know, what we feel is that the pandemic has created a group PTSD, and in some communities where the least empowered, that's where it's most acute. I I, I listen to I listen to proud Asian woman, and I'm listening to an intelligent person who's feeling the acuteness. Of, of, of what's the impact is being. Um, and so I wanted to say, Joshua, USC civic engagement, there's a, there's a, there's a project called Stay Connected um, and USC Keck are a couple of places where you might go look to see what there might be in terms of an opportunity for nurturing the benefit of mental health um, uh, as uh, uh, so solutions through arts, uh, because as I've said it before, um, and, and why I agree with, with, with Ben, that we might be 1.2 uh, as, as far as responders is because arts heal. Uh, and and um, uh, I, I have no answer for the, for the, the, the fringe artists. We're trying, to get, we're trying to figure it out at LAN. How the hell do we get a hold of people that 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 are not affiliated, um, and, or, or and worse, don't even speak English and and don't feel like affiliated? Um, but it's it's something that's in the consciousness of leadership. It's something that that because we talked about it here today, we will be talking about it tomorrow at CFTA and CAA. So thank you for at least voicing those feelings. Thank you. Done, Michael. Uh, thank you for the chance to speak at this point too. And I just want to thank everybody as an old timer. I want to thank you for being part of this today. I attended my first arts advocacy meeting in 1970 when C. Bernard Jackson, the founder of the Inner City Cultural Center called the dance community together. And I've been involved in it ever since. And I just want to alert you that this is not a short run. This is a... <laughs> Uh, a marathon and you're all who are getting into this at this point need to prepare yourself for an ongoing battle. Every success that we have is only temporary until some enemy comes along and tries to attack us again. And you've got to stay involved and you've got to stay vigilant and you've got to stay united as a community. All of us have to. 
because we are all working with the idea that when the sea rises, all shot ships rise with it. And we've got to improve the funding, which is our state has not been at the top where it should be. Our city has not been at the top where it should be, nor the county. And we've got to work to raise consciousness beyond the circle that's been part of this call so that we have great public support for uh, the work that we do and the work that we have to do behind the scenes. Like that, you're sure you have like a permanent marker for all. Awesome. Thank you for being here. And I thank uh, the Arts for LA and the uh, Californians for the Arts leadership teams for helping this be such a successful call. Here, here. Michael, thank you, Tomas. Thank you, uh, amazing warriors on our, uh, so I am gonna use a, a fighting reference on our um, on our board who uh, we're so lucky to have um, and in leadership in the state of California. Leticia Buckley also on our board. Thank you so much for all your leadership here in Los Angeles and throughout the state and for all the mental health support you all give me um as we as we continue this this fight and um you know i just want to say this has been a beautiful conversation i've really appreciated it it what tomas says is so true we too we do listen to this we really take this seriously we bring this back to our meetings it informs the work that we do so and when you see more like this like la is going to do i think um as cordelia mentioned very soon we'll be doing these every six months and we invite you to come to arts culture and creativity month in april participate in that there'll be all sorts of really structured ways that you can engage there'll be unstructured fringe ways that you can engage and um we and you know invite you into more conversations like this so thank you so much for um the conversation and and we hope you all found it valuable. And um, thank you to Danielle for being here for the whole time um, and, and in conversation with us. Your leadership is phenomenal and also your mentorship. And then also to Arts for LA, if they're still here on the call, and to our fabulous staff, Jade, Alicia, and Matt, um, uh, who, Carney, uh, who help us to get through this. And I think Victoria might still be here too. So thanks to everybody and have a great afternoon and stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you all. Well, Mas, love you, brother. Talk soon, brother. You right on, right on, brother. Good to see you, man. Thank you, Julie. I'll reach out. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. All right. Take care. Stay safe out there. <laughs>